saying, if you turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, and I will read for you this, the second verse, I, I want to share with you, and it's going to take me just, just a few moments to develop. You're not going to get it right away. You got to hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So give me just a few moments to, to develop it. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Because I really believe that what I'm speaking, going to speak tonight is going to be in line with what has already been spoken and is going to continue the mandate for this week. Listen to what the evangelist Luke writes in the 10th chapter. Of course, he is quoting um, the words that were probably spoken to him by another apostle because the same text is used in the Gospel of Matthew the ninth chapter, which is also synoptic gospel. In the second verse, he says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. The harvest truly is ripe. The problem's not with the harvest. The problems with the laborers. And this is what the church should be praying. Pray that God will send forth laborers that are able to identify a ripe harvest and are able to gather it for God. So what I want to preach on tonight is I want to preach on the subject, the Lord of the harvest. But I guarantee, as they say in New Orleans, you've probably never looked at it this way before. The things that I speak, I speak by the Spirit of God, though I do not speak them out of the context of Scripture or the early church's teachings and doctrine. What we hear sometimes is new, but it is not new. It's new to us. There is nothing new under the sun. What God is speaking today, He has always spoken. Because it's new to you doesn't mean that it's new. Because you've never heard it doesn't mean it's not God. If you heard it, then it ain't revelation. It's revelation because you didn't hear it. It's revealed because you didn't know it. So everything is not confirmation. Some stuff is revelation. Shandai. Shoot a mosquito. Kickstart a Honda. And it, 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 it frustrates me because we have a generation of people that say that God is only confirming. And they've closed themselves to a fresh word. They've closed themselves to God speaking. They've closed themselves to God continuing to declare. They've closed themselves from having ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And I'll say this while I'm on the subject. The Bible says in the last days there will be a famine, but it will not be for bread or for water. It will be for the hearing of God's word, not for the preaching of God's word. There's no shortage of preaching. There's a shortage of folks listening. We need to read our Bible. Some of us need to just quit Bible college and get hooked on phonics and learn how to read. Because some stuff is so simple you need somebody to help you misunderstand it. All right. So the Bible says, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send labors. The Bible says in the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, if you have a grain of wheat, the hour cometh that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat abide alone, it produces nothing. But if it die and be planted, it shall produce much fruit. Several verses later, Jesus goes on to say, I tell you that if I be lifted up I will, from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This thing said he's signifying his death. He's establishing a spiritual principle. Here it is. Now is the hour when the Son of Man should be glorified. See, what you call glory and what he calls glory are two different dimensions of glory. For us, glory is fame. For him, glory was death. Now is the hour when the Son of Man should be glorified. If you have a grain of wheat, it abides alone. But if it dies and is planted, it shall produce much fruit. He goes on to say that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. The lifting up that he talks about is not our praise and worship services. The lifting up that he talks about is not what we do until the preacher gets up. The lifting up that he was talking about was his death. It is not what we do that draws men, it is what he does that draws men. That's why our services are not designed to bring, him, to bring you, it's designed to bring him. See, if we lift him up, he'll draw. 
Not if we lift you up. We don't care if you don't like what's being sung. It's not sung for you. We don't care if you don't like the old hymns. They're not being sung for you. See, we mistake style for content we like new modern stuff ain't nothing wrong with that but the reality is is that it's not how you sing it's what you're singing it's not the style it's not the beat whether you're clapping on a two four or one three that has nothing to do with it it's what you're saying to him that brings him in the house it is his acknowledgement we come to acknowledge and adore and glorify him we come to exalt his name there is a hymn sung in the ancient church that says holy art thou O god holy art thou O Almighty, holy art thou, immortal one, Kyrie eleison. In the Greek, Kyrie does not mean to be, have mercy in the sense that we think have mercy. Eleison uh, means, comes from a Greek root word that also means oil. So where we translate it to have mercy or to have pity, it literally means Lord empower me. See what you call mercy, what you think is God having pity. But what God calls mercy is God empowering you that through the midst of your trial, you you do not lose your faith but you are able to encourage or empower other people through your situation the hour has come when the son of man should be glorified just give me a few moments I know where I'm going and if I lose you get a transfer it's another bus running in 15 minutes just hang out with me He says, if a grain of wheat abides alone, or corn of wheat abides alone, it produces nothing. But if it die and be planted, it shall produce much fruit. Jesus was a divine seed. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us easily, uh, when, you, when you read the scriptures, in the book of Galatians, the Bible says that God spoke to Abraham that he would bless his seed, not as of many seeds, plural, but as of Christ. So that God never said, I would bless your children, I would bless the Christ that is in you, Abraham. It was Christ that God was looking for all along. And through the people of Israel, God raised up a Christ, a Jesus, who was in Abraham. And those people were blessed because of that seed that was there. It was that seed that God chose to bless. That's why God does not only bless just Israel today, he blesses wherever the seed is. He has a special affinity for, his, for Israel, but God has a, 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 he honors the seed, not his affinity. God is not emotional in that sense. God is not obligated to bless people he likes. He blesses purpose and his purpose was Christ all along so Christ is a divine seed Jesus was a divine seed and he had to find a soil to be planted in that would receive him see it's not enough though a seed has life it cannot produce a plant unless it is planted in a soil that is able to contain it he came to his own his own received them not but to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. So he's looking for a soil or a dirt to plant his seed in. That's why the first Adam was made out of the dust of the earth. Because God knew I'm going to plant a seed in this dirt. That's why when God, before God made Adam, he established a principle. When he made every, every herb, every tree, he said they would all bear seed and each seed would produce after its own kind. In other words, an orange tree will never produce apples. A mango tree will never produce papayas. An apple tree will never produce bananas. Every tree must produce after its own kind. It cannot produce after any other kind. So God ordains that we were made out of the dust of the earth and then he says, I'm going to plant a seed in you and the seed that I plant in you is what I'm going to get out of you the seed that he plants in us is the seed called Christ because if he plants it in us he gets out of us what he puts in us that's why he says as long as you live he told the serpent when the serpent uh, beguiled Eve he said as long as you live you shall crawl on your belly and you shall eat the dust of the earth Adam was made out of the dust of the earth as long as Adam lived after the flesh, Satan had a legal right to devour him. You can sling all, you can sprinkle water, you can get blessed handkerchiefs, you can do spiritual warfare, you can get all the intercessors you want. If you're feeding that serpent, he ain't leaving. 
Only way you can get rid of him is by stop feeding him. Don't get mad at the alley cat that keeps hanging out around your door if you keep putting food out for him. Some of you trying to get the demonic presence out of your life, but you continue to feed it. The first Adam is of the earth, earthy. If you continue to feed him earth, the dust of the earth, he has a legal right to be there. A lot of the stuff that we are dealing with in the, in, in, in the church, it, 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 we bring it upon ourselves because we continue to feed the desires and the appetites of the flesh instead of longing for the things of the Spirit. When we have replaced spirituality with culture and when the church only fulfills a moral obligation but not a spiritual longing. When we come to church because we like it, not because we are mandated to come, not because we are longing for a word. We come because we like the music in the choir. The, the, we pick churches that meet our fleshly need but not our spiritual need. We look for places that will entertain us but not feed us. So we're anorexic in a church dying but we're having a good time in the process. The services and God bless us But the reality is Is that some of us as pastors and leaders Need to redefine worship And rethink what we do To get you here The reality is Is that God is the reason that we are here And our worship is designed to get him here And it's not designed to get you here Because if you don't come back Listen to me Not that will not determine Whether the sick won't be healed Or the dead won't be raised If you don't show up That ain't going to determine Whether the sinner will not repent and be converted but if he does not show up we've become seeker sensitive but not spirit sensitive we have quenched the spirit to make you comfortable rather than making you uncomfortable to get God in the house give me a few seconds he came to his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them did he give the power to become like him. This seed, this life has to be planted in the earth. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7 that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Where is the treasure of God? It is in an earthen vessel. Where is the secret of God? Where is the holy place, the tabernacle of God? Now it is in the hearts of men. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mary walking around on the feast of Passover because you done lost Jesus. You and Joseph done traveled three days outside of Jerusalem and just now realizing Jesus is gone. That's preachable. You can preach that because there's a whole lot of us traveling and not even aware that the presence of Christ is not with us anymore. And when she went to find where he was, the Bible says they searched the whole city and the last place they went to was the temple and it's a shame that we've been searching everywhere for him when we should have went to the first place which is in the temple and look for him where he always was about his father's business perfecting the will and the passion of that that he was sent to do and Mary made the same mistake that we make today she said I and your father have been looking for you I am sorry Mary Joseph is not his father his father was God from heaven and we do the same mistake we believe that we have some human attribute that brings the presence of God but there is nothing you can do to get him here he comes because he wills to come he decides to step out of heaven and step down in the maybe center not because we sang the right songs but because it is our destiny that God inhabits the praises of his people it's not witchcraft it's not some ritual or ceremony that if done correctly God will show up he is not a man that he can be manipulated with our coy phrases and our great sounding music and our cute orchestrated programs what gets God here is when his people long for him and say we did not come to the maybe center to see Bishop Ash we did not come to see any preacher we did not come to just see what you're 
doing we came that we might experience him you're the one that spent your bus fare and your plane fare spending a thousand two thousand dollars to be here God forbid that you'll leave here saying we had a wonderful time you should leave here contemplating and changed and seeing the face of God and saying I know why I was here it was worth the investment it was not a conference it was a holy convocation we came in the presence of God and we were changed we were changed First Corinthians tell us that as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Hebrews 1 and Colossians 1 tells us that Jesus is the express image of the Father. He is the express image of the invisible Father. Jesus is the express image of the Father. Not physically. His human body was not the express image of the Father because God is a spirit. He had no physical body. There was no beauty in the body that Jesus possessed because the Bible says there was no beauty in him that he should be desired. One text calls him but a worm. There was no earthly longing for him. So what was it that he came to express? It was the divine nature of the Father. It was not the physical appearance, but it was the life that was within him that was the Father that was within him. When he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he wasn't talking about his body. He wasn't talking about his earthly features. He was saying, when you've seen the things that I've done, when you see what I do, when you see the way that I live, I am leaving an example for you. The problem with the church is, is that we refuse, we refuse to become like him I ain't got but one message I can preach it a thousand different ways no matter where I'm gonna start but I'm gonna end up I want to be like him see I found my one thing that I've desired of the Lord this ain't got nothing to do with what I'm preaching on but I'm gonna throw it out there to you for free if your prayer list is longer than one your prayer list is too long until you find the one thing that you desire and that will you seek after you will never dwell in his house forever the only way to dwell in his house forever is you got to find the one thing and if you're smart the one thing will include all things but the problem is you're looking for all things to the neglect of the one thing you're seeking the stuff instead of seeking the one who got the stuff if I get him I get stuff if I get stuff without him I don't have the power to keep the stuff but if I get him then he gives me the stuff and it's his responsibility to take care of the stuff keep the stuff paid keep the stuff new and when the stuff get old give me new stuff we've been longing for stuff and not him I want him let him give me the stuff we born the image of the Heavenly Father so Jesus comes along Hebrews tells us a unique text and I wish you'd get this I wish you'd get this by the Holy Spirit in the book of Hebrews the Bible says Lo, I come in the volume of a book. A body thou hast prepared me. Listen to what he says, David. Lo, I come in the volume of a book. Listen to how he's coming. He's coming in the volume of a book. David said, all of my days are sealed in your book. Paul says that we are a living epistle read of all men. John, the last chapter of the Gospel of John in the last verse says, if the whole world were filled with books, there would not be enough to contain all of the works that he has done. Can I prophesy to you tonight that he is still coming in the volume 
of a book. There's four gospels in this book. But there's some other gospels being written. They may not ever come into the holy canon of scripture. But they are as relevant as anything Paul or Peter or Matthew or Mark ever wrote. Your testimony is as relevant as anything they've ever offered. And sometimes when people won't pick up this book, it is your book that they will read and they will see and they will be changed by. He is still coming in the volume. And if the earth was filled with books, there would not be enough to tell the whole story. Because though he only lived 33 years in the earth, his story is not 33 years old. It is still being told because he is still experiencing and still touching and still working in the presence of his people. When we begin to worship in the church, when we begin to come into the church to praise or to pray or to preach or to worship, we do not enter into time this time that we're living in you are not worshiping what's today's date April what 18th April you are not in April 18th at a quarter to 10 in Tulsa Oklahoma this is not where you are from the moment you walked in this building and you purposed to be in his presence this earthly service joined into an unending heavenly service your worship has simply merged with a song that has never ceased being sung from the moment God stepped out of eternity and chose to be made revealed at that moment angels began to sing and heaven began to worship and our earthly worship simply merges and steps outside of the time space continuum and enters beyond what physics can uh, understand and define and our worship simply joins with heaven's worship that's why the scripture says thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven when our earthly worship begins to imitate and connect with what's taking place in heaven something supernatural takes place that is greater than us so that the story that is that's why the blood that was shed 2,000 years is still effective today because when a sinner comes to the waters to be baptized and to the altar to confess and to believe at that moment the sinner does not come to the altar at the maybe center but he walks right to the foot of the cross and that blood is that was relevant and then has the same power to redeem and to heal because time is not um, time is not an entity within itself it is created by God for God and only serves God's temporary purposes time is a cylinder that God created to put man in and let him live for a little while but God lives outside of time and God allows us every now and then to experience the eternal that's what worship is Worship is temporarily experiencing what is eternal. That's a good definition. I'm going to give myself an offering. That was a good. I never heard that one before. I'm paying myself for that one. That just comes to me by revelation. Buy the truth and sell it not. Jesus says a body according to Hebrews 10 and 5 a body thou hast prepared me first Corinthians tells us that ye are the body of Christ listen a body thou hast prepared me first Corinthians tells us ye are the body of Christ and members in particular he is still in his body the foxes have holes the birds have nests but the son of man has nowhere to rest his head he wasn't talking about some place to sleep there was no body that was mature enough for his headship to rest on there was no body that could deal with the weight of his head I'm gonna come back to that in a minute are you getting it hang out with me that's why when the Bible says that God's word will not return to him void but it will accomplish and prosper that that he sent it out to do let me help you here you were born by an incorruptible seed which is the word of God Every one of you was born by an incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. If you were born by the word, and the word cannot return to him void, but will accomplish and prosper everything that he sent it out to do. If you are a word, if you were born by the word, can I prophesy to you? 
you will not return to God until you accomplish and prosper everything that God sent you out to do I'm here to tell you there's not a person that leaves this earth till they have accomplished not a 12 year old daughter not a 90 year old grandfather not a single person leaves until they accomplish it death is not an enemy sneaking in and stealing what's not rightfully his Jesus already conquered the power of death death now is simply a per a tool that God uses to let people know you've done your job now come back to me death is simply a tool a vessel that God uses to tell you you're finished you did enough now return to your origin because the Bible says that the body returns to God but the spirit returns to come on the flesh returns to the dust but the spirit returns to God you can't return somewhere unless you first came from there I'm here to tell you you're not returning to God unless you are already came from God somebody says heresy it ain't heresy Jesus himself said you're not allowed to ascend unless you first descended ain't nobody allowed to go to heaven unless they already were in heaven now for you theologians that would argue the fact and argue the four or the, the fourth council that condemned the Chalcedonian council that condemned the origins teaching of the pre-existence of the soul just this is just for your theologians that came on over from ORU for a few moments to listen to me before you leave you may want to read Saint Gregory of Nyssa who continues to preach it who is considered one of the great fathers of the church and say that if a soul existed outside of God that is heresy but being that God is everywhere at the same time when God thought his first thought he thought all thoughts and all thoughts were contained within the great thought which is the I am thought then their souls that existed existed in him and if they existed in him they are not heresy because they are a part of the divine order that God established from the beginning how you like me now that's what the fathers preached you cannot return to God unless you first came from him that's why some of you cannot be satisfied where you are you thought you were going crazy you thought you were losing your mind because most people just want to be saved enough to get into heaven save enough to stay out of hell and for some reason you just don't want to be saved enough there's something in you that's saying there's got to be more there's got to be a greater level in another dimension in God and where other Christians are just trying to make it in you're trying to do something worthy of the glory and the purpose and the mandate that God put in you and you're struggling thinking you're going crazy because nobody understands you and when you go to your nickel dime prayer meetings they just praying to be dis disappear poof want to get out of here but you're praying for the harvest to come you're praying for revival to come I'm here to prophesy to you you are not crazy the Lord of the harvest is coming and he wants people that can identify that the harvest is ripe Give me a few moments. I'm going to preach in just a minute. Just a minute. Just a few minutes. I'm almost finished with my introduction. You are the body of Christ. Can I read you a verse? Matthew 13, 44. For your edification. Listen to what it says. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. That which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Let me help you. Let me really help you. This ain't talking about salvation. Because you don't buy salvation. Salvation is not free. I mean, salvation is free. You don't pay for it. So this is not talking about salvation. You know, somebody told me one time, I have to say this, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, you know, Azusa is a, is a virtue and a vice. <laughs> it opens up new circles in all different realms for you when you stand in this pulpit. And um, so people always call in and, and somebody said, you know, Bishop, you'd preach a lot better if you just stopped dealing with doctrinal issues and always messing with stuff people believe. <laughs> and if you just stop preaching doctrine and just preach the gospel, 
I said, I could stop preaching doctrine if some folks would stop preaching false doctrine. We've got to correct that that's been taught improperly. So let me deal with a little issue here. It's not talking about the issue of salvation. Because it is Jesus who buys the whole field. The scripture says that you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. So it is Jesus who buys the whole field. Listen to me. He doesn't just buy the treasure. He buys the whole field. See some folks only want to identify with you at your best. Some people only want to be bothered with you when they know you just fully delivered and got it together. When you're blessed and prospering and all is well. But Jesus is not like that. He doesn't just buy the treasure. He buys the whole field. He wants everything in your life, not just the part of your life that you're trying to straighten out. He wants the messy part. He wants the part that nobody else wants to be bothered with. That's why even after he changed the name from Jacob to Israel, he kept saying, I'm the God of Jacob. Why did he keep saying, I'm the God of Jacob, even though Jacob was his sinner's name? Because God is not ashamed to be identified with you when you are at your worst. When other folks don't want to sit next to you during a church service, that's all right because leave that seat empty because when he walks in this building that seats for him because the treasure is the value of the treasure is only determined by the worth of the field what God is doing in your life is only great because of the pain that you have went through. You are only allowed to reign with him if you suffer with him. That's the word. So when he comes, he buys the whole field, not just the part of the field that has the treasure in it, because he wants all of you. He wants the part of you that your family didn't want. He wants the part of you that they almost put you out of the church for. Let me help you here. For those of you who don't read the Bible. A righteous man falls seven times. What makes him righteous is that he gets up. What, what dignifies the sanctification of this person is that they continue to get up. Somebody was discussing with me the recent uh, success of Donnie McClurkin's recent song. A uh, saint is just a sinner who fell down but got up. And so I, I've heard about all this controversy because they don't like saints to be identified as sinners. And says that there's something theologically incorrect with identifying someone who has already been washed in the blood as a sinner and therefore the song is theologically incorrect. Well, let me say something about worship. Worship does not have to be theological. Worship doesn't come from here. Worship comes from here. And I know it's a lot of songs we sing that ain't theologically correct. Like, pass me not, O gentle Savior. I know he ain't never going to leave us nor forsake us. But some of you are God's first cousin, you can't relate. But some of us, we know we're saved. We know God's with us. But when I reach out to touch him, them times the immediate evidence of his presence is not there. And I'm not singing theology, I'm just singing the way I feel. Because sometimes if I just sing the way I feel, God does not always honor theological correctness. He honors a sincere heart. 
It's not your intellectual obscurity that impresses God. It is not your theology and your soteriology and your harmaciology and your ecclesiology and your Christology and all your pneumatology and your eschatology that impresses Him. It is the cry of your heart that impresses God. But there is an issue with our ego that makes us afraid to identify ourselves as a sinner. Something in us is terribly wrong if for no other reason the abundance of the revelation of who we are in God's kingdom is so great. If you ever really knew who you were, if you ever figured out who you really were, the devil wouldn't stand a chance against you. But that knowledge oftentimes gives birth to pride. So if for no other reason the confession is proper, because it keeps the mandate on my life balanced, So that I am always aware that whatever God is accomplishing in my life is by grace and not by human merit. So a saint is a sinner who falls down and they get up and then they fall down again and then they get up again. And they fall down again. I know some of you are God's first cousin and you ain't never fell. But don't fool yourself. Your long dress and clean face don't impress nobody. Your hook a messiah and shoot a mosquito and kickstart a Honda don't impress nobody. Because daily we wrestle with our flesh. Daily there are issues in us. If you say that you've not sinned, you already have sinned. You have deceived yourself. The problem is, is that the church, I'll say this because I'm orthodox. You can't say this, but I can. Is that most of you suffer from Romophobia. You're so scared of the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not Roman Catholic. I'm Syrian Orthodox. But you continue to keep the same doctrines that you fear with you. So now you have distinctions in sin. Though you don't call them mortal sins and venial sins, you still have in your mind that one thing is worse than another. But every one of you that lied on your tax report every one of you that gossiped said something that you didn't have proof on and slandered every one of you that thought you was better than somebody else self-righteous devil sin is sin Having offended the law in one point, you have offended the law in all points. Every one of you is an adulterer. Every one of us is a whoremonger. Every one of us is a thief. For if I broke the law in one point, I broke it in all points. I'm going to preach in just a minute. I'm almost finished with my first point. He buys the whole field. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. When Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, the Bible says that he took that silver to the high priest and says, I do not want it. They refused to take it back because it was blood money 
and it was now the Sabbath and they could not defile themselves. So when Judas hung himself, they took the silver and they went out and bought a potter's field. A potter's field is where strangers were buried or non-Jews. It's also where if pottery was not perfected, if it was broken and no good, they threw it in this field that was also a cemetery. Can I prophesy to you? They had to buy that potter's field because you and I were in that field. We were broken pieces of pottery that nobody could use. There nobody else saw worth in us. We were strangers and foreigners, not worthy to be in the presence of God. But through the grace of God and the disobedience of one man, God still found favor and took his sin and turned it around for our glory. He bought the field because we were there. Give me a few moments. Judas. Judas' disobedience brought us into relationship with God. Except a grain of wheat die, or except the corn of wheat die, and be planted, it produces no fruit. Hang out with me. But if it falls into the earth, if it dies and falls into the earth, it will produce much after its own kind. The first Adam was a living soul. But the Bible says he was of the earth earthy. There was no life in him. Dirt has no life in it. Though it has the nutrients to sustain life, in itself it is not life. The seed within itself contains life, but has need of the soil to nurture the inherent life that has always been present. So Jesus, the divine seed, is planted in the earth. And when it is planted in our earth, it will produce after its own kind. Hang out with me. I'm going to get to the Lord of the harvest in a minute. It produces after itself. God only had one son. But he wanted many sons. So he allowed the one son to die and be planted. So that when he resurrected, God didn't just have one son. The one son brought many sons to glory. So God, having willfully given his one son, now gets many sons. By allowing the son to be planted, now many of us become like him. Are you with me? When this seed produces after itself, it gives us all the power to become like him in every aspect of our life to manifest the divine nature so that the likeness that was lost in the garden now can be restored. The nature, the image was never taken from us, just the likeness. Adam was made in the likeness and the image of God, right? He lost the likeness, not the image. That's why now you are the sons of God and it doth not yet appear where you should be, but when he appears you shall be for you shall see him as he is. You'll be like him. So he's getting back our likeness. We're getting back our likeness. The image is always there. That's why the devil hates you. Let me, let's say this. Let me correct this theology too. Or, or this cliche. Stop telling sinners that the devil likes them and he hates you. The devil hates everybody. You know, he ain't messing with you because you're out there in the world. Yes, he is. Save folks ain't the only ones going through hell. He hates anyone that the image is in. And God never let him take the image just to continue to irritate him. No matter how low a person gets in life, doesn't matter how bad they, how low they debase themselves, doesn't matter how much he can defile them, he can never mess with the image. So there they are, down on crack, strung out, in sin, whatever it is, alcoholic, drunk, whatever it is, addicted, whatever the issue is. In the midst, you know what? The devil still hates them. 
Because he can't get rid of the image. Why? Because you will always be spirit. It does not matter how much he can defile the human body. He can never defile the spirit. That original that God breathed is his. It can never be taken from him. And it doesn't matter how much he fights you and attacks you. That one thing is never destroyed. Now when we come to Christ, we are now learning to add to the image the likeness. That now the image that has never been defiled has a worthy likeness that is attached to it so that we grow to be like him and to do the things that he does. Are you with me? Hang out with me. I know where I'm going. John 1 and 10 says he was in the world and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. The disciples got the revelation of who he was. They knew he was the son of God, but they did not know how to live after that level of sonship. They did not know how to live after that mandate of a spiritual walk. See, the reality is, is that most of us know about him, but there is no practical life attached to the head knowledge. It is not enough to know about him and not be able to experience what he has left for you to experience. Now, here's where we're going to get into some meat now. Watch. Hang out with me. This is the issue. I would speak unto you as spiritual, but I can't, Paul says, because you're carnal. Here's a church, five-fold ministry, all the gifts, all of the gifts in operation, and yet carnal. The abundance of spiritual gifts does not distinguish spirituality. It is not the gifts, it is the life. It is not the perfect life, it is the submitted life. It is not a person who does not make mistakes. It is a person who is totally submitted to Christ at all times. Whose perfect yes and submitted obedience to the passion of God causes their vile body to be changed into the image of his glorious body. Are you listening to me? Paul goes on to tell the Hebrews that you ought to be teaching others, but I have need to teach you again. Why? You should be eating meat because meat belongs to those that are mature, but you're back home milk. Here's the issue. Here's the issue. Watch it. Jesus tells his own disciples, I have yet many things to share with you, but you are not able to deal with it right now. The reality is, is there are places in God that God has purpose for us, but we will not experience them. We will not see them. We will not understand them. We will not comprehend them until we are willing to grow up. The issue is not being gifted. The problem with the churches is we are continually seeking gifts, continually trying to outdo one another instead of seeking to grow up into him, the full measure and the stature of Jesus Christ. Everybody wants to be a great evangelist. Wants to be a deep wonder in Zion. Wants to be awesome. But listen to me. Anointed ministry is the secondary consequence of private devotion. People who are used by God did not seek to be used by God. They sought Him. And they got apprehended by that that they would apprehend. They were trying to get God and God got them before he could get them. Or before they could get him. Are you with me? Now watch this. He was in the world. They didn't know him. They got the revelation of who he was but not what it meant to them. They knew he was the son of God but they didn't know how to manifest what he had prayed or what he had revealed to them. To grow up into him. Here's what I'm getting to. Luke 9 says that they went to, the, to a city where there were many Samaritans. When they went to the Samaritans to tell them that Jesus was coming, catch this. Jesus is getting ready to preach. He wants to go to the city. They don't want him to come to the city because they know after that he's going to go to Jerusalem. The disciples say, why don't you call fire out of heaven and kill them all? That's what they said. 
Sound like some of us? We continue to feel like it is our job to defend God. Like God can't defend himself. We're still operating as Old Testament sons rather than New Testament sons. We wanted to call fire out of heaven instead of understanding that these things just have to be. The path of sonship instead of choosing the path of obedience instead of choosing the path of humility we continue to choose the path that brings death to our life hang out with me I know where I'm going Peter's confession thou art the son of God the Messiah the living God son of the living God later on Jesus is about they say he's gonna be crucified Peter says not one over my dead body tell him to bring it on they got to come through me Jesus tells Peter, thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of man. In other words, you don't understand that you're still operating after the flesh and not after the way the Spirit of God deals with things. We are cursed in this generation because the church continues to deal with things after the flesh and not after the way Christ wants things done. You can blame it all day on secular society. People are not being converted because there is nothing in us that they desire. There is no attribute of the kingdom worthy of conversion. You cannot say repent unless you can finish the sentence. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We got a lot of folks preaching repentance, but there is no manifestation of the kingdom men will not come unless they see the kingdom it is not our ability to bring them it is our ability to manifest God's kingdom that will cause men to repent if there is no repentance there is no kingdom where the kingdom of God is manifest men will repent and they will come listen now I'm almost finished you got to understand it is a lonely place when you long for the higher levels in the things of God it is a lonely place when you begin to say there's got to be more. It is a lonely place when you pursue truth above entertainment value sermons. It is a lonely place when you begin to desire to preach not for the sake of preaching, but you desire to preach that truth may be revealed and men may be changed. It is a lonely place and there are few people you can sit at the table and enjoy covenant relationship with who are not concerned with the shoes you wear and the car you drive and the home you live in and how much money you get paid to preach but people who are saying I do this because I have a mandate to do it I preach not because it's the end thing but because I have something to say that is a secondary result of me attaching myself to God I didn't seek to preach you cannot seek to preach you cannot seek to be a prophet you cannot seek to be evangelists. You cannot seek to be any of these things. You long for him. But we got a generation of people that long for everything but him. We number the people rather than long for God. It's a lonely place. Jesus says that there's a 30-fold realm. When you plant seed, it produces some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. The dimension in God that you're longing for some of it will produce 30 fold and you can stay there if you want the outer courts exciting if you ain't never been there if you've never been to the outer court you throw a party but after you've been in the outer court for 30 years you ought to begin to wonder what's going on in the sanctuary after you've been in the sanctuary for 20 years, y'all don't begin to wonder what's going on in the Holy of Holies. The problem with the churches is that we're just so excited about what's going on in the outer court, we don't even entertain. And if you begin to tell people that you want to know what's going on in there, they begin to say something's wrong with you. You're too deep. Doesn't take all of that deep revelation. 
You don't have to be deep. Just keep it simple. What? Name me one thing that Jesus said that was simple. Jesus was the most profound person I know. Well, nothing simple about the things he said. Unless you're willing to leave father and mother. Brother and sister, you're not fit for my kingdom. You want to gain your life, you got to lose it. I've come to bring a sword. I come to put you against your family. What's simple about that? Whoever does not eat of my flesh or drink of my blood will have no part in me. What's simple about that? What's simple? There's nothing simple about the things that he says. The problem is, is that we've had simple preachers who are afraid to challenge us to deeper levels because they themselves feared to go into these places. Let me help you. So they kept us simple and told us we didn't need to be deep. But let me help you. How many of you got the Holy Ghost? Raise your hands. How many of you do speak with tongues as the Spirit give you utterance? Let me tell you something about the Holy Ghost. He moves over the shadow of the deep. He doesn't hover over shallow puddles. He only hangs out with deep oceans. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you're already deep. You are deep enough to contain God himself. If you can contain God, Paul said, be filled with the fullness of God. Baby, you ain't shallow if you can be filled with the fullness of God. Are you listening to me? God's mandate. Now, I know where I'm going now. Here, listen, listen, listen. This is what he longs for us to do. That we come to the next level. We cannot remain where we are. God spoke to me this evening. I was praying in my room. And he said these words to me. He told me so clearly. He says, unless my people fully perceive who they are. Unless they fully perceive who they are. They will always be subject to the powers of the enemy. They cannot be free from his onslaught until they reestablish their identity. The thing that the devil attacked in the garden was their identity. Eve, if you eat from the tree, you'll be like God. Hear me, she was already like God. He only attacked what was already hers. Let me say this, because this is, this is set you free. The devil is only allowed to attack what God has already affirmed. Whatever he's messing with is because God has already made a spiritual promise there. Hear me. You ain't getting it. Eve, if you eat from this tree, you'll be like God. He was attacking something she already had. The devil can only attack what God has already established. He only is attracted to what God has already established in the spiritual realm. You, you ain't getting that. If he been messing with your money, the only reason he messing with it is because he knows God has already made a spiritual promise concerning your wealth. He been messing with your family, he wouldn't mess with them unless God has already made a promise there. He been messing with your church. He been messing with your members, messing with your building fund, messing with your program. It's because God has already made a promise there. He only attacks what God has already affirmed. Now, now I'm getting to the Lord of the harvest. Now here's where, here's where we go. Listen to what it says. I want to read you a passage of scripture. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruits of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. Listen to me. What is he waiting for? He's waiting on the precious fruit of the earth. Hear me. Mark 4 says that the earth bringeth forth fruit herself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full ear in the corn. Then he thrust in the sickle and gathers it to himself. Hear me. First the blade, then the ear, then the full ear in the corn. 
What is the husband man looking for? He's not looking for the blade. We've been teaching that the harvest, we've been teaching out of sincerity that the harvest is when souls come into the kingdom in great numbers. No, that's not the harvest. The harvest is not souls. What farmer do you know that the moment a little green stalk shoots out of the ground, calls his workers and says, it's time to reap. He doesn't reap green shoots. He keeps hanging out and he begins to wait for a field that begins to produce fruit. He doesn't come to reap green grass or freshly spouted or sprouted trees. He waits for a mature harvest. The harvest is not for new souls. Is for a mature church he's not waiting for many souls to come he's waiting for you that have been here to stop playing childish games and grow up into him he's tired of you acting like a child and talking like a child and living like a child He's waiting for you to grow up into him. Put away your childish things. So why does the Lord of the harvest come? He looks over the field and the harvest is ripe. But there's few laborers that are willing to identify that the field is ripe. Few laborers are willing to recognize that he doesn't want numbers, he wants quality. He wants folks who are walking in spiritual maturity, who are walking in spiritual authority, not just the masses. He wants those who are fully grown up, who are putting away childish things and are becoming like him. Grab your name and say, it's time to grow up. That's the issue. The issue is it's time to grow up. Stop playing games and come to spiritual maturity. The harvest is ripe. There are people who are leaving the place of spiritual immaturity. And God is challenging leaders to identify the ripe field. Let me say something to you. Let me say something to you. When a mother feeds a baby, it's a nasty thing. You got you a 16-year-old boy at home, and you got to grind up his steak because he don't have the power to digest it and chew it. You got to water it down with some pablum for your 16-year-old boy, 30-year-old husband. That's not right. But a baby, you can add something of substance to its formula and it grows. You give a baby a piece of steak and even though he won't be able to eat it, he'll suck every dropper. <laughs> Come on now. And we're so scared. What about the babies? What if we don't want to offend, we don't want to be too deep because of the babies. But if they don't understand it, the reality is those that are new have ears to hear. It's those of us that have been around and think we know everything. Attacks against ministry never come from babies. It always comes from those that have been around and think they got a corner on the market. Those that think they understand a God who is beyond comprehension and who think they can define what is indefinable and name what is beyond a human name and comprehend what is beyond human comprehension. Are you listening? 
the reality is that there is a generation in the church that is coming up to another level and they're saying I'm sick of playing games don't feed me any more milk I don't want another bottle give it to me I don't care how deep it is God will give me the ears to understand it because the Bible says eyes have not seen and ears have not heard neither has it entered into the hearts of man what God has prepared for those that love him but he hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of God don't tell me what I'm not able to comprehend the Holy Ghost that I have is searching all things especially the deep things of God it's time that we shake ourselves and let the devil know I'm not playing no more games I'm no longer a child the Lord of the harvest is waiting for you to grow up into him which is the full measure and the stature of Jesus Christ what God is doing doesn't belong to just anybody what God is doing only belongs to the mature those that are able to rise up from where they are and say I refuse to be satisfied hear me Azusa when you leave here this year you ought not walk out of this place telling folks it was great it was awesome I hate it when people tell me you did a wonderful job that was a great message I don't preach to be wonderful I don't preach to be great my message ain't supposed to be lovely you're supposed to walk up to me and tell me I've been messed up I don't know what to say I didn't enjoy it cuz my mind is stirred and longing for another level I didn't come here to entertain you we come here night after night that we can be elevated and come to the next level that we can say in ourselves I want to be like him there's got to be more than this there's got to be a greater level than this there's got to be more than we're hearing and more than we're listening to the Bible says in Revelation 19 that John was in heaven and he was walking around and he saw somebody come up to him and he fell down and began to worship and whoever it was said get up John don't worship me I am one of your fellow brethren in other words there were some folks that were already in heaven that began to look like Jesus so that when John saw him he fell down and wanted to worship but they said John I'm just like you but I realize who I am I realize what I'm like I'm here to let you know there's a realm you've not yet seen there's a place you've not yet walked in there's a spiritual realm you've not yet experienced you cannot remain where you are you cannot stay in that place you cannot leave here unchanged you gotta tell God whatever it takes ah, ah, I want to be like you I got to 
to be like you oh lord then restoration is not only when you lose something restoration is when god gives you back more than you lost is when God restores he lost the first Adam but he got the whole garden back the first Adam died or sinned in a garden the first Adam sinned in a garden the last Adam was buried in a garden the first Adam sinned on a tree the last Adam died on a tree the first Adam brought forth thorns the last Adam wore thorns the first Adam was a thief the last Adam was killed between two thieves the first Adam brought death the last Adam brought life the first Adam brought a bride the last Adam is marrying a bride the first Adam covered his wife the last Adam covered his wife we are being restored we're getting back more than we lost we went in a baby I always ask God God in the garden there was the tree of life why did they not eat from it God spoke to me because they were not mature enough to eat from that garden they were not mature enough to identify the tree only the mature can deal with the tree of life the immature eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil how do you know you're a baby because you're running around saying that's bad and that's good that's bad and that's good that's bad and that's good that's the tree of knowledge and you're a baby when you make those decisions those that are mature eat from the tree of life and they say God in him I live and I move and I have oh, yeah, oh, yeah, my very being listen here and I'm finished the first Adam I always ask this Michael why did Jesus or why did Adam eat from the tree without telling Eve lady you're crazy something's wrong with you how can you eat you done messed it up but Adam knew that Eve is my wife she's my responsibility so when God comes he's gonna kill her but if I'm her husband then it's my job to protect her so he said baby give me that fruit and he ate from it because he said when God comes if he wants you he's got to come through me I ain't no punk and no sissy I'm your husband and I love God but I'll protect you I love God but I'll take care of you well if the first Adam could do that how about the last Adam Jesus looked at his bride the church he saw our sin he saw our mistakes and he said but I, I love her and if God is gonna get my wife he's gotta come through me he was bruised for our iniquity wounded for our transgressions the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we were healed say yes yeah, yes oh God, yes hallelujah there's a realm we're growing up into why am I feeling all this pain it's grown pains you're maturing no more babying the church wants to preach the deep things of God but we can't because every week 
we got to teach you how to tithe every week we got to teach you how to get along with your neighbor every week we got to teach you how not to gossip we're teaching you life skills instead of deep truth we got to teach you how to cut up your credit cards teach you how to get a savings account teach you how to love your wife teach you how to be a good father but there's deep things in us that we want to preach but we can't because you're too busy being babies but Lord don't leave us in this place but elevate us mature us bring us higher Oh, God. The harvest is ripe. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send. Send workers that are discern you. It's time as the church, you come to a place of spiritual maturity. Let the church know, let us preachers know, you're not selling for milk no more. You want meat, you demand meat, you need meat. The Bible says that Jarius' daughter had been dead and when she died, Jesus came to her and the Bible says he laid his hand on her and she recovered. Everybody else said she was dead, but he said she's not dead. She's just asleep. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what charisma says. I don't care what Christian groups say. The reality is we may look dead, but God says, the church is not dead. She's only asleep. But I'm about to lay my hand on her. Hello, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I'm about to lay my hand on her. And she's about to recover. And the Bible says, when Jarius' daughter got up, he commanded the servants, go get meat and feed her hear me when the church gets up this time she ain't looking for milk when she gets out of this grave when she gets out of this bed she wants meat she wants the deep things of God she wants the great things of God the harvest is ripe is for the mature and only the mature throw your hands up and say I want to be mature I want to be mature that's what I want look at your name and say I'm tired of playing church I know why I'm here I know why I'm in this building tonight God is challenging me to come to another level look at somebody on the other side and say hey you you're not crazy I know you felt like you were going crazy but you're not crazy you're right where God wants you there's got to be more there's got to be another level there's got to be another place there's got to be a greater realm there's got to be a higher dimension say it say it yeah. oh God All across this building. Lift your hands all across this building. He's planting a seed in you right now. If you plant apples, you get apples. You plant oranges, you get oranges. 
You plant mangoes, you get mangoes. You plant Jesus, you get Jesus. He planted Jesus in your earthen body. Some of you pastors have been waiting for your churches to explode. And God is saying, but I'm not just sending anybody. Let me say this. And I'm finishing. And then we're going to pray, but I'm going to pray over you. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. For the perfecting of the saints. Yes. Hear me. Not a single one of those ministries is for the unbeliever. Not one. Not the evangelist. Not the teacher, not the pastor. They all belong to the believer. The reason we've got to do the event, bring in the souls, make the altar calls. The reason we've got to go through all of those. You know why we have to do that? Because you're not doing your job. Uh, it's true. People should already come in converted. My God. You call yourself evangelizing or whatever it is you call it. And all you did was invite someone. An invitation is not, is not ministry. Anyone can invite somebody to church. But only a mature person shares their life. And lets there be a divine exchange. By the time we preach, they should already be in the kingdom. We should only be confirming what has already been established. Glory to Jesus. But we can't do that. Because so many of us continue to remain in the immature place. Psalms 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the anointing or the precious ointment that runs down Aaron's beard. Yes. The anointing does not belong to babies. Mm. It belongs to those who can grow a beard. Uh, grow a beard. You got to grow up yes. if you want to get the anointing. Wow, wow, wow. I'll never forget this and I'll finish. I was reading a Clorox bottle one day and on the side of the Clorox bottle it says, dangerous in the hands of children. Mm. And I thought of all of the great things that Clorox does. It whitens, it brightens, it cleans, it disinfects. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how great of a product it is, in the hands of a child it is dangerous. It doesn't matter how great the anointing is and the presence of the Holy Spirit. God poured out His Holy Spirit on Azusa Street. Not that we would redefine the Holy Spirit because He did not need redefinition. He poured it out that He would renew us. Not that we would birth new denominations with it. But that His fire would touch those that were dead and dried up. And instead we took a precious gift and divided it over and over and over again. Over stupid stuff. Unimportant things. Hallelujah. And God is saying tonight, I'm pouring my spirit afresh on this generation. Yes, God. But I'm not giving it to babies this time. Not to babies this time. I'm pouring it out on those that are mature. Not those who want to call fire. But those who want to eat from the tree of life. Some of you are so frustrated tonight. You come year after year after year to conference after conference after conference. To one conference or another conference. Because there's something in you that's saying there's got to be more to God. There's got to be another level. There's got to be a greater anointing. There's got to be more. And you're frustrated because you know you should be in another place. You know you should be in another realm. And you can't enter it into it. Just of Jesus. But tonight the Holy Spirit is speaking to this place. Heaven and earth are joining together. Mm. Earth will be a mirror reflection of what God is doing already in heaven. And men will see the glory of God as they have never seen it before. And they will be changed from glory to glory. Who does the harvest belong to? He's not harvesting souls. He's harvesting those that produce fruit not those that produce gifts those that produce fruit 
hear me I felt this so hard I was in the plane flying here and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said this is gonna be a year of tremendous shaking in God's kingdom God spoke to me and said there'll be a shaking the like of which we have never seen in every level in every place and God says I'm not doing this because I'm angry that's what the Holy Spirit spoke to me it's not a judgment I'm doing that that only that that has been built on my kingdom will remain and then God spoke to me and God says get ready I'm doing it also to teach the church compassion yes and to once and for all destroy the spirit of self-righteousness so don't be shocked when the kingdom of God begins to shake everything in our lives because only that that was established in the kingdom will remain Hallelujah to Jesus Bohoroko shandelebe isen dandanda ikotora se. For there's coming a change this year, even even in this conference. For mandates are being given, and only those that have ears will begin to hear what I'm doing. For the Lord says to this generation, behold, I am distinguishing the mature from the children mm. and only those who have fully given themselves to me will I use in this hour for I am breaking every bondage yes. every shackle every weight in the both sides that has hindered my people from entering into the next level Everything that have discouraged them from believing me for the next place I'm removing from their life. Yes, 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 yes. And this year I am removing convenience that I may build covenant. Oh God. Ha is said on his For there's coming a turning in my church. A turning for this ministry. A turning even for this conference mm. your spheres of influence are going into different realms and different places Jesus. I'm giving new people and for everyone that walks away I will add seven more yeah. for everyone that wanted to do their own thing and not build another man's dream I will send those who will be willing to stand not for a season but for a lifetime.